The following sermon was recorded at Tri-State Worship Center at The Point. Tri-State Worship Center is a church of God founded in Southern Ohio, where we encourage the saints, help the hurting, and embrace all people. Watch, listen, and allow Pastor Terry Wagner to help you find your path to enlightenment. awesomeness. Thank you that we have a reason to rejoice. Thank you that you are our God. This morning as we've gathered in this place, our prayer has been that our worship has been a sweet, sweet sound in your ear, and that it has prepared us now for your word. So God, open up the ears of our heart. Open up our spirit this morning, that we might have a teachable spirit to hear from you this morning the word of God. Not a doctrine, not a dogma, not what some church believes, but what does say the word of the Lord. And I pray that as we receive that this morning, our lives will be changed by the power of your word. God, I'm so thankful this morning that you are our God. Help us this morning to rejoice in you always. For it is in Christ's name that I pray. Somebody say amen. amen. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving day. I hope your house was full of family and friends. I hope you took a moment just to thank God for who he is. And all of the great things that he's done for us. Has he done anything good for you? Say amen. amen. We had about 20 people at our house. We celebrated Thanksgiving on Friday because we had people coming in from out of town. And Vicki and I had the opportunity to go out and have a Thanksgiving dinner with Elizabeth Fullerton out at the nursing home where she's at on Thursday. So Friday we had Thanksgiving at our house, about 20 people. And I remember growing up, Thanksgiving, you would hear things like, hey, I need more turkey. Or, hey, there's not enough mashed potatoes. Or, hey, I don't know where to sit. Or, hey, who ate all the pie? You know what I heard? The most oft-repeated comment that I heard at my house on Friday, hey, I can't get on your Wi-Fi. <laughs> Dude, it's Thanksgiving. You don't need no Wi-Fi. <laughs> For a while this morning, I would like to just take a little time and just dovetail onto the sermon from, from last week. We discussed why bad things happen to good people. And what we discovered was that there are about four dynamics that are involved in bad things happen to good people. Number one, sin. Sin is in our world. We live in a fallen world. Therefore, bad things happen. Secondly was self, because God created us with the will of our own to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And unfortunately, some people use that freedom to do bad things. So sin, self, and then there was Satan who wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. And, and you need to understand something. If he's been pounding on the, the, the door of your heart, you need to understand thieves don't break into homes that are empty. There must be something in there that he's trying to steal from you. And so it's not just sin, it's not just self, but it's that guy named Satan that is not your friend. As a matter of fact, he's a sly old fox, and we'll leave that right there where it's at. The last thing that we talked about last week was the sovereignty of God. Somehow in God's providence, He understands things that we don't. Somehow in His providence and His sovereignty, all powerful, all knowing, everywhere, all the time, He knows things that we don't know. And when bad things happen, 
what we landed on last week was when bad things happen, the worst thing that we can do is begin to redefine God. The worst thing that we can do is say, well, these bad things have happened, therefore God must not love us like we thought He did. Or God must not have power over uh, Satan like we thought He did. And we began to kind of redefine God. As a matter of fact, someone once said what we do in those times is we try to make God in our image rather than being made in His image. And so I would encourage you today, as I did last week, that bad things do happen, but we have a good God. And He is greatly to be praised. And I'm sure you've seen the sign either on the front of a church or, or it seems like everybody's got graphics they want to put on Facebook nowadays. But that sign that says, no God, no God, no peace. No God, N-O, no God, no peace. That's kind of what it boils down to when it comes to these times when bad things happen to good people. And I really want to kind of talk about that this morning because Isaiah 26 and 3 says, You, Lord God, will keep in perfect peace those who are steadfast because they trust in you. Not because they trust in the government, not because they trust in law enforcement, not because they trust in any institution here on this planet. But the Lord will keep us in peace whose minds are stayed, is what the King James Version says, stayed on Him because we trust in Him. And so I want to share for a few moments on the topic of rejoicing results in peace. Rejoicing results in peace. If you have a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're just going to use verses 4 through 9 this morning. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a verse and then we're just going to talk about it a little bit and then we'll go to the next verse. So if you have your Bible, Philippians chapter 4, starting at verse 4, we're going to read out of the NIV this morning. First, Verse 4 starts with this word, rejoice. Look at me. For us to rejoice, don't you think we probably need to understand what the word means? Right? Let me tell you what it means. According to the, the Greek, it means to be well. Rejoice. Be well. Matter of fact, it goes another step further and says, be glad. Be glad. I said, be glad. Amen. It even goes another step further and it says to thrive. To thrive. To rejoice is to be glad, to be well, and to thrive. And if you even go to the uh, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary, you'll see this definition. To feel or show great joy. To feel or show great joy or delight, which I think is awesome, but I like the next part of this definition. It is to cause joy. See, we think rejoice is just about me. Oh, mm, I feel good. <laughs> no. To rejoice is to be well, to be happy, to thrive, to express or to feel joy, but also to cause that joy for other people. Now we've got a lot of verses, to, we've got other verses to get through. That's just one word of the first verse. But you need to understand something. If we're going to rejoice, it's not just about us. It's about somebody else too. And I just wonder if we took a test this morning, how many of us cause joy in other people's lives? Rejoice. In the Lord. Be well in the Lord. Have great joy or delight in the Lord, who is the supreme authority. Not just every now and then and not just when it feels good. Look at me. Always. Now let me give you what always means in the Greek. Always. All the time. Everywhere, all the time, on every occasion, without exception, continuously. Hello? without exception, continuously, uninterrupted. And then when Paul's writing this to the church at Philippi, and he's writing it to us here today, he said, I don't think saying it once is going to be enough. I'm going to say it again, he said. Rejoice. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Does anybody think it's strange that a man in prison wrote this? A guy that was in jail? A guy who was in a Roman a dungeon? Some of you will get that. Some of you won't. Does anybody think it's strange that the mind is talking? Never mind. Uh, that Paul wrote this while he was in prison? Listen to me. If anybody had a reason not to rejoice, it was Paul. But he's in prison, and he's telling me and you who are not in prison that we should rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I'm saying it to you, rejoice. 
And here's what this speaks to before we go to verse 5. Verse 4 speaks to our ability to do what God wants us to do, regardless of the circumstances or the situation. Paul didn't say rejoice when everything's going your way. He didn't say rejoice when it feels good. He didn't say rejoice when uh, you wake up. He says rejoice in the Lord always, continuously, uninterrupted. And he said it doesn't matter what's going on. I'm telling you to rejoice and I'm in jail. And it really speaks to our ability to will ourselves to rejoice. Well, Pastor Terry, you just don't understand what I've been through. Listen to me. Regardless of what our circumstances are, regardless of what our situation might be, God is good. God is good. And because of that, we rejoice. Because of that, we are well. Because of that, we thrive. And so here's the lesson that we've got to learn in verse 1, or in verse 4, the first verse that we've talked about. Our inner attitude does not have to reflect our outward circumstances. I like that. My inner attitude does not have to reflect what's going on outside of me. Matter of fact, in 1 Thessalonians, it says to rejoice in the Lord always. Oh, I'm sorry. It says in everything give thanks. I got my verses next. In everything give thanks. It didn't say for everything. In everything we can give thanks. We can choose to do that. Even King David said, I will bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. This verse speaks to the simple fact that if the Bible tells us we can do something, we are enabled, empowered to do it. And if it says to rejoice, it doesn't matter what's going on in life right now, you have the ability to rejoice if you choose to rejoice. That's really what that first verse is telling us. Look at verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And here's the reason why. Because the Lord is near. It doesn't say let your meanness be known to all. It doesn't say let your grudges be known to all. It doesn't say let your bitterness be known to all. It says to let your gentleness, and the King James says moderation. Let your gentleness, your fairness, your equality be known to everybody. Not just believers, but unbelievers alike. Let your gentleness be known to all. And the reason why is because, number one, if we're going to be Christ-like, we need to let our gentleness be known to all. But number two, it says in that verse, the reason that we want to let our gentleness be known is because God is near. Anybody else grow up with a mom who used to say, now would you do that if Jesus was sitting next to you? My mom would say that. Would you do that if Jesus was sitting next to you? And the truth is, He is sitting next to us. He is. He is near. So we let our gentleness be seen to all people. And because of that, listen, we don't seek revenge. We're not overly vocal about our rights. We're not gossipers. We're not backbiters. Well, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this is a prayer request so that you'll pray about it. But did you hear about... Now listen, I was told this in confidence. So when I tell you, I'm telling you this in confidence. Don't forget to pray for so-and-so because did you hear what happened? That's not, the Bible says to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness. I wonder how many people walk into our life. I wonder how many people cross the path that we're on and feel gentleness. They feel that from us. Versus how many people go across our path and feel something not so good. Maybe some judgmentalness or maybe some unforgiveness. Maybe we should move on. Verse 6. Now, does anybody here believe that when we're instructed to do something in the Bible, that it is a suggestion or a command? Do you believe it's a suggestion or a command? Amen. We're commanded, right? When we're told to do something, it's commanded. So you know what these first few words of verse 6 say. Do not be anxious about anything. Look at me. Don't be stressed out about anything. Don't be freaked out about anything. Don't be broken up about anything. Now listen, not a suggestion. Not a suggestion, a command. Be anxious for nothing. And here's how. In everything, through prayer and petition, 
And with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Present your requests to God. He said, here's how you can keep it together. You keep it together by allowing God to know what's going on. He knows what's going on, but you've got to vocalize that to Him. Through prayer and through petition, you make your needs known to God. And if you'll do that, he says, you don't have to be anxious. Now, in the book of James, we're told that if we know to do right and we don't do it, it's sin. Are you listening this morning? See, I know you're not going to amen me because then that means that you've got to not be anxious. I understand. And to some of us, that's a challenge, not to be anxious. But here's what the Bible says. If I know to do right, okay, watch, the right thing right now, is that the Bible's telling us, don't be anxious. That's the right thing. Now, you can't leave here this morning and say, well, I didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be anxious. I'm telling you. The Bible says, don't be anxious. So if I know to do that and I don't do it, it's a sin. Can I walk in right standing with God if there's sin in my life? I don't know if I'd go to hell over that, but I don't know if... I don't know if I can walk as closely to the Lord as I should be able to walk as close to the Lord when I have something in my life that's not supposed to be there. Something that's missed the mark. It says don't be anxious about anything. And the reason why is because you can make your needs known to God. Now listen, I'm not sure any of us can imagine what life must be like without being anxious about anything. But if you can imagine that, then you can understand that's exactly how God wants us to feel. I don't, know if you can, I don't know if we can imagine that. A life that is anxiety-free, a life that is stress-free, that's, that's the life God wants us to have. Not that one that's full of stress. You know what that old saying is? It, it says, if you're going to pray, don't worry. Right? If you're going to worry, don't pray. Why? He says, listen, you don't have to be anxious because you can make your needs known by prayer and petition to God. And he says, if we'll do that, Listen to me. If we'll do that, verse 7 then says, what, before we read it, you've got to get this. Look. See, what a lot of people do is they quote verse 7 out of context. Somebody going through a tough time, you say, well, you know, the Bible says the peace of God that passes all understanding is going to be with you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, if we rejoice in the Lord always, if we let our gentleness be known to everybody, if we learn how to not be anxious because we're making our petitions known to the Lord. If we do those things, verse 7 starts, and the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. <clears throat> Look at me. It's not just the peace of God that comes in when times are tough. It's if we've been doing the things that we're supposed to do. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let our gentleness be known. Be anxious about nothing. Make our petitions known to Him. When we do that, it says that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our mind. What's that mean? Listen, it's like it's a military term. It's a military term that says there's a garrison of soldiers that will be set up to protect your mind and protect your heart if we will rejoice in the Lord, if we will let our gentleness be known, if we're anxious for nothing, hello? Then the peace of God that this world doesn't understand will set up a garrison around your heart and around your mind. And suddenly you're going to be protected. See, true peace is not uh, in positive thinking. True peace is not in the absence of conflict or in good feelings. Here's where true peace is at. Isaiah 26 and 3, we read it earlier. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. And all of a sudden we have that peace that guards our heart. As a matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 5 we're told that it's God who gives us breath and life and controls our destiny. It's God who does that. So why not put our trust in Him? He says, He'll keep me in peace those whose minds are steadfast or stayed on you. Those who trust in you. And when you and I learn to do that, somehow, someway, this peace guards us. And I'm going to call it this. I'm going to call it crazy peace. It's a crazy peace. It's a peace that nobody understands. It's the kind of peace that you will get called crazy over. Because you're going through a tough time. The world seems to be falling around you. And you're going, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And people say, 
You're crazy. And you say, crazy peace. I got a peace that you don't understand because why? Because my mind has stayed on the Lord. My mind is steadfast on the Lord. And I put my trust in Him. The very moment that we put our trust in other things is the very moment that we open ourselves up to be disappointed. Because He's the only thing that doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. So here's what Paul says to the church at Philippi, and he's saying to us this morning, learn how to rejoice in the Lord. Not just for yourself, but for somebody else. Let your gentleness, let your moderation be known to everybody. Don't be anxious about anything. But with prayer and petition, make your needs known to God. When you do that, the peace that this world doesn't understand, then will rule and reign in your heart and in your mind. And then he goes to verse 8. And he says, finally. Now look, that means he's not done. That's a lot to take in. That's a lot to somehow digest. But he's not done yet. He says, finally, furthermore, brothers and sisters, who's he talking to? It's not a trick question. Who's he talking to? Us. Here's what he says. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on those things. He said, if you're going to rejoice in the Lord and you're going to let your gentleness be known, you're not going to be anxious because you petition the Lord with your needs, suddenly you're going to have this peace. And in that peace that's guarding your heart and guarding your mind, you need to fix your mind on the right things. <coughs> Listen to me. You have to fix your mind on those things that are good because what we put into our minds will determine what comes out of our words and our actions. What we put in here determines what comes out here and here. The old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You put garbage in, that's what's coming out. But the problem with some of us is, is we think somehow we can behave our way into a right belief system when that's not how it works. What you put in here determines on how you behave. What I believe will determine how I behave. If I believe that God is for me and not against me, I'm going to behave that way. If I believe that there's a peace available to me that this world doesn't understand, then my behavior is going to reflect rejoicing in the Lord, letting my gentleness be known, and not be anxious about anything. Now the opposite of that also has to be true. That if your outward actions don't reflect an inner belief, then we've got a problem. Then we've got an issue that we've got to deal with. Because right thinking leads to right living. Wrong thinking leads to wrong living. <coughs> Paul spells it out in detail right here in this verse. He says, this is what you ought to think on. He said, whatever is true. There was a research, some research done that indicated that only 8% of what we worry about really comes to pass. Watch. Only 8% of what we worry about comes to pass. The other 92%, the other 92% is either imaginary or it never happens or it's circumstances that you don't have any control over. And so what we do is we allow the 8% to dictate how we live our life. Because that's what we think on is, is the, the thing, the part, the 8% of that 100% that we think might be true. But all of a sudden, here's this 92% that may never happen, may not even be true. Maybe circumstances that we have no control over. He says, you need to think on what is true, what is honest, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, what is of good report. I think that sometimes as believers, we get ourselves in trouble because when we see somebody who's done something wrong to us, we don't follow this. We don't do what this tells us to do. When we see somebody that's hurt us or somebody that said something about us that we didn't like, we don't let our gentleness be known. What we do let be known is the bitterness, <coughs> the anger, and the unforgiveness. And then we wonder why we don't feel like we're at peace. 
And it's because we're not being obedient to the Word of God. And when we're not obedient to the Word of God, listen to me. The opposite of obedience is not disobedience. The opposite of obedience is disbelief. I really don't believe that God wants me to do that because if I did believe it, that's what I would do. And I don't know, I'm, it's probably a good thing that, that, that God's the judge and not me, but I'm pretty sure from what I read in Scripture that sin separates us from God. That's what I read. And I'm pretty sure that I read that there's, there's no sin allowed in heaven. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I read. I don't know if that's... I'm pretty sure that's what you read if you read the same Bible that's got duct tape on it that I do. <laughs> Not just any old duct tape, all right? This is gray, good stuff. It holds things together. If it can't be fixed with duct tape, it ain't broke. <laughs> My daddy always told me. He says, whatever possesses virtue and whatever has praise, Whatever motivates you to do better. Think on those things. He's saying, why would you waste mind power on things that tear you down? Why would you waste mind power on things that are not going to help you? Why not think on the things that are going to motivate you to be better? It's going to motivate you to do better. That's what he's saying. Psalms 119, 165 says that there is great peace. It's great peace. For those who love the law. And when we love the law and we have that great peace, it says nothing can cause us to stumble. You want to stumble proof your walk? There it is. Great peace have those who love your law. And nothing can cause them to stumble. Right thinking results in right living. Because it all it, it's a thought. If we can think a thought... Then we do a deed. We've all been down that road. You do a deed. You determine a character. Determine a character. Determines a destiny. It all begins with a thought. Just a thought. That's why the Bible says to take all your thoughts captive under Christ Jesus. Somebody say, well, I can't do that. Then you're calling God a liar because he tells us we can do that. And he's saying, why not think on the things that are going to motivate you to be better and do better? Instead of thinking on all the ugliness and all the bad stuff. And then he says in verse 9. Whatever you've learned, whatever you've received, whatever you've heard, whatever you've seen me do. Who's talking, Paul? Who's he talking to? The church. Whatever you've seen in me, whatever you've heard from me, whatever you've seen me do, put these things into practice. Exercise these things. Perform these things. And here's what he says. And the God of peace will be with you. Whatever you've seen me do, whatever you've heard me do, Whatever you've watched me do, if you'll do these things, then the God of peace will be with you. I think the number one weapon of the enemy in this time frame of, of Christianity has to be unrest and stress and people who don't have peace. And this verse is telling us what we have to do. Do the things that Paul's saying to do, and the God of peace is going to be with us. You can't separate you cannot separate outward action from inward attitude. If my actions reflect a belief in the promises of God, then you're going to know that's my inward, act, my inward attitude. My attitude is I believe God says that there's not a weapon formed against me that can prosper. I believe that God says greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I believe that God tells me that I'm his child and that I can be blessed. I believe that there's peace that this world doesn't understand that I can have when I learn how to rejoice and not be anxious and let my gentleness be seen by all people. Hmm. Listen to Isaiah chapter 32 verse 17. The work of righteousness, the work of right standing, here's what it is. It will be peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Quietness and assurance forever. What, what's the result of it? It's the result of right living. James 3.17, but the wisdom that is from above is first, pure, then peaceable. It's simple. Right living is, necess is a necessary condition for us to experience God. Right living is a necessary condition for us to experience the peace of God. Right living will bring rejoicing that results in peace. Why? Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. I'm reading this out of the Williams New Testament. It says it this way. 
Let the peace of, that Christ can give keep on acting as an umpire in your hearts. I just like the way it says that. Let this peace that Christ can give us continue to be the umpire that's saying, that's out of bounds, don't do that. That's right, do that. That's wrong, don't do that. And that comes when we find ourselves in this right standing, this righteousness, this rightness. And he says, if we'll do that, then suddenly our outward action will reflect an inward attitude. And so here's what I need us to struggle with this morning. If the Bible tells us that we should not be anxious, if the Bible says that, and James tells us that if we know to do right, we don't do it, it's sin. If we then are anxious, and if we do worry, is that a sin? Is that a sin? Let me read one more passage of Scripture and let you, let you determine whether it is or not. Linda, if you'll come. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 24 to 34. Listen to what it says. No one can serve two masters, for you'll hate one, love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or they don't make their clothing, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, He will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? These last couple of verses I underline. Listen carefully. Verse 31. So don't worry about these things. Don't worry about these things. Saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your Heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Verse 33, one of the most oft quoted scriptures in the Bible, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously he will give you everything that you need. The last verse. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. Can anybody say amen to that? He said, don't worry. Don't worry about these things. Because when we worry about those things, the enemy has us distracted. He has our minds detoured from what we really should be thinking on, which all those things are true and pure and lovely and praiseworthy and virtuous and all the other things that Paul listed in verse 8. Don't worry about those things. What you really need to do is focus your mind on Him because He knows what you need. And who else can really bring us what we need? Who else can really bring us what we need? Listen, you might think, well, you know what I really need is a new car. What I really need is a bigger house. What I really need is a new spouse. What I really need are new kids. Listen to me. No, you don't. What you really need is a glimpse of Him. What we really need is to understand what it is to be right living. That doesn't mean we do everything right. I hate to bust your bubble this morning, but I don't know anybody that does everything right. You can talk to me after church if you think you're that one. Okay? I don't know anybody that does everything right, but I know a lot of people that try really hard. And I just believe that when we learn to rejoice, the result of that is peace. It says that. That if we rejoice in the Lord always, if we let our gentleness be known, if we're not anxious but let our petitions be known, then the peace that goes beyond understanding rules and reigns in our heart and in our minds. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I want that. I want that more than anything. I've got salvation. That's locked in. I'm not worried about that. But I want the Lord to guard my heart and my mind with His peace. Well, how does it happen? <coughs> Rejoice. Be gentle. Don't be worrying about stuff all the time. Just trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. But in all of your ways, acknowledge Him. And then He directs your path. Seek first the kingdom of God and all of His righteousness. 
And then all these other things will be added to you. All these other things that you need, they'll be added to you. But it only happens as we focus on Him. Stand with me. Dear Holy Father, this morning I'm so thankful that you've given us the privilege of coming into your house and gathering in your name. I'm so thankful that we had the opportunity to praise you and to worship you this morning. We know that in that, that that is a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. And I'm also thankful this morning for your word that gives us the instructions for this life before the next life. And I pray, God, that somehow, some way, the instructions that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi are instructions that we will receive this morning. That we would have a teachable heart and a teachable spirit to hear what your word is telling us. That yes, life can be tough. Yes, bad things do happen, but you're still a good God. And when we go through difficult times, that does not change who you are. It just challenges what we believe. And God, when those, those beliefs are challenged, let us, let us come out with a good grade. Let us come out knowing that you're a God that loves us and cares for us. You're a God that's intensely involved in our lives. That there's nothing that goes on that you're not aware of. There's nothing that happens that you're not involved in. And God, when we believe that, then that belief comes out in our actions. That belief is manifested in how we behave. So God, help us this morning to receive your word. I pray that in Christ's name. As your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, let me just ask this morning, if you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you were at one time, walked away from that. Maybe you've never made a choice to serve him. I want you to understand this morning that your life will never reach the potential that God has for it until you have learned to ask Him to forgive you of your sin and accept Him as the Lord of your life. When that happens, it doesn't make bad things go away. It doesn't make terrible things quit happening. It just means that you're never alone. That you can rejoice. That you can let your gentleness be known. That you can live a life anxiety-free when you petition the Lord with your needs because it will be His peace that will rule and reign in your heart and in your mind. And if you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Christ. I've got good news for you. The news is this. God loves you so much. He sent His Son to die for you that if you would just believe on Him, you wouldn't pay you had everlasting life. So I'm going to ask the praise team if they would to sing this chorus through a couple times. And I want you to understand that if you're not in a right relationship with Him this morning, you can be. And I would love to pray with you. I would love to pray that prayer with you. But the choice is yours. If you're not in a right relationship, would you come as they say? Don't wait. Come now. Regardless of the situation, learn how to rejoice in the Lord and just let your petitions be known to Him. Just, just say, Lord, you know what's going on in my life. You know what I'm going through. And I just, I just need you to take care of it. But until you do, I'm going to walk worry-free. You say it's impossible. No, it's not. It's not impossible. You just have to trust the Lord. You have to seek first the kingdom. You have to let His peace rule in your Amen. Vicki's going to come and give us some announcements. When she's done, we'll be dismissed. I appreciate you being here this morning. God bless you. We hope that you have been ministered to by today's sermon. Our prayer and hope is that you find comfort and encouragement in these words, as well as instruction and correction.